Bird, 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 bird! Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Well, you know who this is and you know what show it is. And I'm going to save you all a lot of time today in this intro because, well, I'll just tell you what happened. I was driving home. My wife and I went out and got a bite to eat. And I've had bronchitis for just about over a week. And it's really on the way out. But, boy... Sometimes, if you ever had bronchitis, when you get a coffin jag. So the other night, I was on the back porch playing a. a we, we, my wife and I, even though we're old folks, we play sorry that that old board game, right? We, it's our kind of our ritual, or we play Farkle or a card game. But and I got in a coffin jag, and she was talking to me, and I couldn't see her. It only lasted like a second, and she said, so "What's the matter?" I said, "Well, I could hear you, but I couldn't see you." Well, there's some kind of a nerve reflex that saves you from dying when you're coughing too much. Well, on the way home from Eaton tonight, just on our gravel road, I was about a quarter mile from the house and started coughing. And I could hear my wife saying, Ron, Ron, Ron. And according to her, the truck was going all the way to the other side of the road. And then I woke up. And I got back in my lane, which there was no lanes on a gravel road, but literally. Anyway, all that being said, I'm going to save you any more than this intro. I'm just going to tell everybody how much I love them from my Patreon patrons who have always supported this show. Onyx, my title sponsor. Four-wheel campers. Pike gear. Boss shot shells. Waltons. Gunner kennels. Garmin, W Supply, Purina Pro Plan, and K9 Athlete. That's it. And, of course, the Upland Institute. But that's it. Uh, can you believe this? Like a two-minute intro from me. I just got to get through this. It was a little scary. I've been Googling, coughing, and passing out. I'm going to go to the clinic in the morning and maybe see if they need a little stronger cough medicine. But, honestly, I'm feeling way better than I did last week with coughing jags. But that one scared me. Anyway. This episode shouldn't scare you. This is with um, Kevin Stewart, and I was supposed to get up and go to the summer grouse camp, which is such a fun fun thing to do. But Kevin and I, I said, I, I can't make it, Kevin. There's about a 2% chance I'd make it, which means 98% chance I won't. I'll make it next year. But I said, let's get on. Let's catch up. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about our dogs, all that other stuff. So anyway. I love you guys, I love you girls, and I love not passing out when I'm driving a vehicle. So I am going to be very careful. You all be careful. You all have a great day. You all have a great night. You all have everything. See, you can tell. Can you tell I'm kind of messed up? All right, everybody. I promised I'm not going to announce the name of this podcast or the host's name because if you already hit the play button on Spotify or iTunes, you know you're listening to Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. So I didn't have to say that. Anyway. I am on a Zoom call with Kevin Stewart. And Kevin, I don't want to screw this up. You're the president of the Roger Moore chapter of Rough Grouse Society, right? Yep. Yep. And that's kind of, is, is it, isn't that one of the more historical, I, I would say, Rough Grouse chapters in, in the state of Michigan? I would, I would agree with that. Roger was, uh, he started the chapter. I mean, he was part of it for 35 years before he passed away. I think we had. Well, you might have been at the 40th anniversary. I don't know if that was a year yeah. ago or two years ago. Yeah, I maybe. know you came to our event one time, or our yeah. banquet one time there in Fenton. But, um, yeah, he was kind of a pioneer and dog trainer and um, pretty good legacy. What, was, he a, uh, was he a dog trainer by trade or by, by vocate, just by fun? Because I, I studied up a lot of bird dog stuff, and I didn't know the name, so was it? kind of specific to the field trial world or was it specific to just RGS? Uh, he was just a gun dog. He was a state uh, retired state trooper by trade. And then once he retired, he went into training dogs, I guess, 
full time or in the summer before he right. went to grouse camp. So no, enough to pay for his hobbies. Right, right. But the chapter is named after him, Roger Moore. Yep. You know, yep. I, I think of my Masonic lodges around the country, and most of them have odd names, and every one of once in a while they're named after a person. So I always figure that person had to be pretty influential, you know. Right. Right. And what's your position now? You're the president of the club? Yep. Yep. I've been uh how did you know, probably last how did you get talked into that? Well that <laughs> Well, Roger passed away, and there was kind of nobody else left to do it. So okay. when we started, there was about two of us um, mm-hmm. after Roger passed. And then we've kind of um, built it up pretty good. There's probably and some of our meetings anywhere from 15 to 18 people at them. So. Well, that's good, because I always say if you can get 10, you got something. Right. And we've had yeah. – uh, and our average age is, is under 50, so we consider that a win, too. Oh, <laughs> Well, you're not, you're not even a rough grouse chapter society. If you're, right. your average days is under 50. Right. Right. Um, right. because it's, it has been historically, um, uh, I wouldn't say as older guys, but it, I mean, because the baby boomers, right. You know, I'm a baby boomer. So yep. there was just more of us and they got involved when the chapters got built and the younger guys didn't come, but it seems like the younger guys are coming now. Right. It doesn't, it, it it seems like it's really attracting the the younger when i say younger i mean like 30 to 50 instead of yeah 40 to 60 so to speak yeah it's a lot of guys with their first dogs um mm-hmm. are looking to get involved uh we our chapter does a lot of habitat work so i think that's another draw for our chapter um but yeah it's it's been fun so far and uh you're you're not no uh no volunteering remorse yet not yet not yeah, yeah. We're still going strong. So yeah. Well, I know I got to come out with Justin to your chapter event. Uh that was I think that was two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a good event. And then what we kind of wanted to highlight today, and then we're going to talk about dogs and hunting and all that other stuff. Um the Roger Moore chapter summer grouse camp. And that last year you, you held it for the first time. Yep. I showed up there to do a little glad handing and drink some of your beer and eat some excellent food. Right. Um, and that was held at the Gladwin field trial grounds and it will be again this year. Correct. And if, if anybody in the state of Michigan that listens to this podcast, and I know you're out there cause we know there's a lot of them. Right. It, we all kind of like, well, uh, I'm going to back this up. Your first grouse hunting experience, was it because you were an RGS member or was it because you were hunting before RGS? I was hunting before RGS. Um, yeah. I didn't even know what RG, RGS was until we met. Roger was a dog trainer. We had our first dog. Um, it was out of field trial lines. And mm. we'll just say it was a little hot for us to handle. A little uh, much. It was a little oh, much. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. We, we had to chase the dog down a few times just to, <laughs> to get just, her back. Just so you could go home, you had to chase the yeah. dog down. Right. She was, yeah. you know, 14, 16, what, you know uh weeks old and stuff and yeah there wasn't a lot of a lot of cum in the dog it was just <laughs> run the other way so well and what's neat about this so so you started you you, you jumped in with both feet no chapter but you're like i want to i want to get a grouse dog and you 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 met roger moore and yep. you had to be a little at your point of learning it and this is what so many people go through with the bird dog world at your point of learning it, you weren't even thinking about age, stem density, habitat, food. You're like, I just want to go hunting, right? Right. right. I'm supposed to dog that just wanted to run. <laughs> well, well, yeah, you buy a pointing dog, it's supposed to right. find all the birds. Like people right. are like, We don't have a dog, we shoot birds. And it's like, well, you have a dog, you're supposed to I mean, you should get ten to one what we get. Yeah, it, uh, it doesn't work that way, does it? No, you learn very quickly. It's it's pretty humbling, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, you learn real quick that that's not how you don't go shoot a bag limit over a pointing no, dog. Every I mean, day. you you could get uh, what would be called statistically blessed and have a great first day, but right. guaranteed if you decided to buy the dog and then become the grouse hunter, if you got statistically blessed, you might as well buy a lottery ticket that day because it ain't it ain't gonna happen. Exactly. <laughs> And what's cool about 
um, the grouse camp, the summer grouse camp, and I wanted to, I'm going to say this a bunch of times during the podcast. It's Saturday, August 19th. It's up at the Gladwin Field Trial Grounds. And for those of you who don't know anything, Gladwin Field Trial Grounds is a literally a historic field trial grounds for, I, I, I would say in general, pointers and setters, right? I mean, the, it's yep. the dogs that are pr- predominantly there. But it's been around, isn't it like, it's not a hundred. How long has it feel? Yeah, I, I there? think it's been a hundred. They just, I think it's like maybe 105 years now. Okay. Because they had their anniversary a few years back, the hundred. So years it is a hundred. It is a hundred. Yeah, I'm pre- pretty sure of that. Yep. And this property is totally groomed and managed. There's no hunting allowed on it. But it's, it's exactly what a secessional forest would look like that's full of grouse. Right. right. I mean, it's probably the best manicured. It's a giant gem site that you can't hunt, and yeah, no birds get perfect, killed on it. Perfect, perfect year, analogy. So. And for people who don't know what a gem site is, we have we have in Mich- in state of Michigan. Um, give me the acronym. Gems is uh, enhanced uh, grouse enhancement management. Management. And I'll tell you, I hunted one of them, Kevin, up in the UP. It was. I'm not trying to hotspot it because they're all in the maps. It right. was west of Barriga. There was nobody there. And I didn't, I, I got into three grouse in, in, in the first 10 minutes of walking. Now, <laughs> would I got into three more grouse every 10 minutes? No. But <laughs> they, when, when forestry's done right, it, it just, it, it, they grow them like cockroaches. They really do. And yeah. So the Gladwin Field Trial Grounds, how many acres is that? I can't remember. You might remember, Kevin. I, it's a few it's, thousand, I'm sure. Oh, you know, it's thousands, right. Yeah, I, I, I dare say 5,000. It's, I mean. No, I think you're right. I think it's around five. Yeah. It's a good chunk of property. And they've got all these different courses for when they do the field trials and, but the beauty of it is it's, it's in a constant management state, like which would habitat would be in normal circumstances 500 years ago before we got here and screwed things up right (laughs) there's there's you know storms fires all that stuff disrupts the forest and and they've just taken it to another level and they hold this these these field trials out there in fact justin good friend of ours you know justin he, he judges dogs out there and the reason you guys have this grouse camp is to kind of like say hey you're you're not really trying to get anybody into field trialing because that's that wouldn't be fair to do to anybody, right? No, we just want to expose people to one. I mean, there is field trials running there. You're welcome to walk, or you know, there'll be professional trainers. Um, you know, and we're just trying to expose people to grouse hunting, different. I mean, different venues, different things to do with your dogs, and um, and raise a little money for our chapter through, you know, a little education and. Yeah, it's camaraderie. Yeah, it, when I I said that kind of tongue in cheek, we're not trying to make you into field trialers. We'll wait till your second year of having a bird dog before you decide to do something. <laughs> right. Right. But um, the fact that they can hold these trials on on literally wild birds, there's not many trials in this country that are held on wild birds, and it's because yeah. of the management of that field trial grounds. And. Uh, I did this, I think it was four or five years ago up in Eagle River, Wisconsin, and RGS had me come up there to do a little glad handing and do a podcast about it. And I always remember there's one young guy, he's he's now a patron of the show, and he's a poodle pointer guy. And he came up to Eagle River, Wisconsin from Tennessee because we talked about like learning, learning what the forest looks like, learning a little bit about what the dogs do. Learning, right. learning, like getting into the minutia of hunting, as opposed to what you did. Like I'm just gonna go, and what I did, <laughs> right? Give you gives you a little picture of, like, this is what I should look for when I do it. And and then meeting some, you know, there's always gonna be some guys at one of these events and girls that have some experience and absolutely, who doesn't love telling you how, how much they know about grouse hunting, you know. I haven't met somebody yet that's turned me away about talking about it. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Like that's not going to happen. Um, right. So I want to encourage people. If you're within 
you know, I, I'm not saying a two days drive, but if you're in a day's drive of it, it, it's Meredith, Michigan, and it's the Gladwin Field Trial Grounds, and this event's going to be now you you're, you're going to be there the night before, but the event is Saturday, yep. August nineteenth. Yep. Um, what can someone expect? To, like if they say, "Hey, I want to show up. I want to show up." What can they expect to see and do that day? Uh, there'll be the DNR. Um, we got the Upland game specialist, uh, Adam Bump. We also have Chad Stewart, who's the Michigan big game specialist that we thought would be neat for him because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all outdoorsmen. And I think yeah. I'm shooting from the hip a little bit, but like a deer or elk's uh, diet's probably 70% woody debris, call it. I mean, so they can benefit from early successional foresting or cutting the same mm-hmm. as grouse. So, I mean, hunting's kind of getting a bad reputation. So our view is we're stronger together and all, whether you're a deer hunter, a grouse hunter, um, we, we can all benefit from early successional foresting. So now Chad will talk, Bruce will talk, um, Adam Bump will talk, we'll go over some habitat, food sources. Um, and like we're going to have a little Q and a session. Um, if you got any specific questions, I know the, uh, we're grouse hunters, but there is that pheasant stamp. Um, Mm -hmm. It's kind of expanded a little bit. And I know Adam Adams, I think I would assume in charge of that. If you have questions on that. Um, Also, we have uh, Scott Smith, um, a vet out of the West branch area. who's going to talk about osteoarthritis prevention. Um, I guess 40% of dogs get it. And usually a hundred percent of working dogs get it. So there's some things that um, he he has a little speech prepared uh, on how to prevent it. Um, I think the, we were talking, you know, the sports injury or dog injury thing is always a good, but a lot of people have covered that. So this is just something a little bit different. And yeah. he'll also be there for the Q&A section of, I'm sure he'll give some pointers if, you know, last year I had a dog get laid open on its wrist and, and stuff, had to get a bunch of stitches. So hopefully... He'll give a little crash course on what to do on that type thing. Yeah, I'm sure well. if you can pull him on the side, you can learn something from him for sure. Yeah. Yep. And Got then, um, yeah. and then we're gonna have a little habitat tour. Uh, there will be a field trial going on. I think they want to do a little presentation. And then at the end, we have um, we'll call it cocktail hour. We have Ugly Dog Distillery coming up to, um, I guess, have or pour some adult beverages for us and have a little camaraderie afterwards. So. So you can bring your own beer and you'll have Ugly Dog Distillery taking care of the good stuff. Yep. Yep. You can't I, beat it, man. <laughs> I can't. I, well, the only way you could beat it is if you got the invite I got from you last year. And I've drawn a blank. Who was your buddy there that had the other trailer uh, that was cooking? Aaron. There? Aaron. Aaron. Yep. You guys, you guys, you take this to another level, right? We did pretty good last year with that. You draw, you rolled out a mobile kitchen. <laughs> yeah, I we did. Professional smokers and professional bakers. I mean, like you you have a trailer with a ramp, and then you have plywood outside of that, and it looks like you walked into a kitchen. <laughs> I mean, you 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 got you had every I don't know all the different meats you guys had, but I mean it, it was like that alone, you go there and, and you guys will serve lunch up there, right? Yep, yep, yep. I could tell anybody is like, go there, shake a hand, and go get lunch because you and Aaron knocked it out of the park. I, I Thank think, you. Thank you. I think, I think sometimes you guys like to cook and talk more than you like to hunt, but you're right in my neighborhood <laughs> because cooking and talking, it's half the reason we do this stuff. Right, right. Nobody went away hungry. No, and nobody went away going, oh, it wasn't a good event. I didn't learn enough. They all went away going, have you ever had smoked brisket that good in your life? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Right. Uh, It was was great. Um, In fact, last year we had uh, Ben Jones was there from uh, the the CEO of Rough Grouse Society. Have you heard any, uh, I I don't want to say rumors, but weather-wise, you're on the other side of the state, basically, um, how's things looking over there for habitat, rain, broods, anything you, any reports on your end? Uh, the, 
Well, the brooding season we felt was probably a nine, like a nine or 10, like, cause we had almost a month of drought weather there. We, uh, actually we did a habitat project in the spring and we planted like 50 soft mass trees and we got a big tank of water and actually took five gallon buckets and watered the trees. We were so worried about the drought. Wow. Um, but then we seem to be getting pretty good rain now. So since the end of June or July 4th, kind of on we've had about rain once a week i'd say so yeah so we could have had that nice dry not it certainly wasn't cold which can get bad in nesting season right you know, and if everything's good you could get a a cold snap and them chicks just can't make it so we had really good wet winter wet spring we had the nice dry I, i'm i'm expecting uh i'm expecting good things i haven't been out yet running dogs but i'm, I'm confident that it's it should be good i mean and I haven't talked to a bunch of people who've been out yet. It's kind of, I mean, it's always so thick and hot, humid to get out right. now, but. Right. Do um, you, do you, Kevin, do you run your dogs before grouse season? I do. I never used to, and I do it just a little bit, but I kind of pick and choose those days. I don't, I wouldn't say I condition them. I maybe make a trip to, you know, get out to say yeah. I, I got out early season or, you know, right. running, but not a, not a ton. It's just, um, it's another thing that takes up time when you, oh, you know, you got time. You're the president of the chapter. You should be able right. to delegate. You, you got time. Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, no, no. Traditionally, I mean, maybe once, twice just to scout a couple of new spots or just to yeah. get out and stretch a dog. But now besides the field, tri- now, obviously it, it's not going to be season yet. I always kind of thought like with the Gladwin field trial grounds, I I don't want to say it's a reproduction. I don't say it's like a waterfall reproduction area, but it's, you know, like thousands of acres of ideal habitat for grouse and woodcock, which is yep. undisputable. Right. Is there decent hunting public land around Gladwin? Not not the grounds exactly, but does it get more agricultural or is is there some decent stuff close by? Uh, there's decent stuff close by within a couple miles. There's a ton of state land and stuff that, uh, Gladwin County has traditionally done a pretty good job of, of cutting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think on probably 20, 30 minutes away, there is that lame duck, uh, gem site that's, you know, yeah. great to train, to train dogs on, um, like every other grouse spot, it gets pounded pretty good in, in actual hunting season, but, uh, right. yeah, but yeah, there's a ton of state land. In Gladden County, this. And I, I would encourage people who, whether they are coming to this or just going to listen and and cheat and not come to it. And yes, the gems is like I told you about that one gem up in the UP I went to, and it, it was middle of the week. There was there wasn't a soul there, you know, thousands right. of acres. And yes, they do get hit, but to take use of that, let's just say, I I know people that would be like, yeah, we could legally get our dogs back out in the woods because it's after, you know, it's mid July, but you know, if it's a late hatch, you know, you don't want to get in too many young birds, but taking advantage of the gems in like August, right? Take your dog out and go walk, just walk the trails. That's love to do that. You're going to, you're going to bump into some birds. Your dog's going to get a little experience. You don't have to worry about missing the bird because you can't carry a shotgun, you know? Right. Right. Um, it, it, it's something that people should not. Is that is that a double in time? Is is something that people should not not do? They should get out there in August instead of going to soccer games and all the other stuff that you have to do with family and kids. But get your dogs out in August on some of those gems. They may be a little crowded on opening day, but you'll you'll really see. Like if you can't come to the grouse camp, you will see very similar managed properties right as it would be in gladwin yeah yeah that um i would think uh the trails are a little bigger groomed um on a gem site the trails on the i mean of course you can't hunt or train on the field trial grounds but right. i mean they have a path that goes through like a half hour course it's basically big enough to get a horse down as or a horse yeah. through for the judges and then um that's it but the gems i don't know they got pretty good whatever a uh, eight foot mowing deck or six foot probably brush hog, whatever the DNR uses to, you know, 
yeah, swipe it, around. It's it's a great walk in the woods. I mean, yeah, for early season, it's spectacular. It, it's and and people just don't. I, I know everybody's busy, but they, I don't think they take advantage of that, you know, and the birds are there. You're not really putting a lot of pressure on them because you're not shooting them. Right. You know? And your dog can learn some stuff, but they can learn more if they come to the, to the summer grouse camp, you know? Yep. Yeah. Cause there'll be professional trainers there too. Like um, yeah. just kind of hanging out and, and stuff like that. So everybody's got questions about dog training or what situational stuff or something. And so did you ever think I, I get this idea in my head, you know, trying to get people to come to something when you're planning, like you're in charge of planning this, you'd almost be like, how come everybody that hunts grouse in the state of Michigan doesn't want to be here? Because, <laughs> but there's only whatever the percentage, whether it's 1% or two or three that will go a little but be of and above and beyond what it takes to become a hunter. And right. the jump start that you can get if you're new to this is is invaluable. It really is. Right. And, I mean, besides the food and the drinking and the beer, and, and if you got to stay overnight. Now, can people can camp there, right? There's yep. nothing for yep. camping. There's a campground. Yep. They just uh, what do you like a rustic campground? No, uh, yeah. uh, there's a pump. No electric or no um, yeah, water self, or anything. Self contained. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Self contained. Yeah, there's the, plenty of spots the story, there. The stories and the fires will go on till the wee hours. That's, Cause, that's, cause I've heard have... that's happened before. No, 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 never. <laughs> um, I think me... we had you out there pretty good for two nights in a row. So yeah, and I should have like you guys put me up in a. It, it was a great little, it, the old fashioned Michigan Midwestern mom and pop place. You know, all the grouse hunters stay there. The fly fishermen stay there. Yep. Oh, I saw you and Aaron's rig. I'm like, I, I will tell you this because of this year between all the stuff I'm going through between my wrist and getting sick and going to Florida, I'm going to, I give you a personal guarantee that next August I'm going to bring me and I've got a self-contained camper now. All right. I, I pick it up in Sacramento on before I go to North Dakota and everywhere I go now, I'll be sleeping wherever I drink. It's going to be the dog. It's going to be great. Be, oh, it's, it's going to be fun. So I will guarantee you there is still a 8% chance that I'll be there this year, but okay. there is a 101% chance that I'll be there next year. All, all right. You, great. All you can do is organize it. Um, yeah. Give me a little update on your dogs. Like, uh, and, and I, and I'm going to be, I'm always transparent. You know, we, we drink <laughs> beer and we cooked and we talked last year. I'm like, Kevin, give me your dog. I didn't ask for your dog's names, but I, I know you had dogs. You got two, and I had to ask you, you got two pointers and yep. one setter. Yes. Uh, what, this... what was the path on that? Where Because you, you kind of alluded to your first one was a little much. Well, it, the first one was an English setter field trial. Right. And then uh, as I got older, um, great dog, I thought, um, oh, I always wanted an English pointer. And I thought I'd, I'd keep it in the house. Short-haired dog would be great, was my logic. Yeah. You quickly realize that pointers shed pretty good, and that the little pin hair gets stuck in everything. It's harder, so, to, it's harder to clean up than the longer hair. Yes, yes. But it, it was a good dog. And then, um, then I actually got another uh, pointer and kind of turned into be uh, a field trial dog. And was actually ran at Gladwin for probably two or three years. Um, and then he decided that uh, he liked porcupines a little bit. So um, we we had to retire him. And then now... Uh, a little bit or a lot? <laughs> well, I just we'll just say that um, I'm pretty good with a pair of needle-nose players. So I'm, I'm pretty efficient. And then, uh, so that led me when you got one retired and a dog that's nine, you better figure you better do something. So, um, so I got a, a year old English setter now. So, um, he just turned a year, probably two, three weeks ago. So kind of been working with him and hoping to get, uh, hoping for a good fall, get him into a lot of birds this fall and see what he's got. What did you look for when you were getting that setter? Or did, and I don't, and I don't want to lambast field trial because i've been told that 
A good field trial dog is a good grouse dog, especially a glad one, right? Right. So you, have, you almost have to be a professional trainer with some of the octane or some of the, what do you want to call high desire, right? Right. The, yeah. The intensity of them. The intense. Exactly. When you got to setter, where, where did you go for the setter? You don't have to give a name up if you don't want to, but I mean, what was your, how was your decision making? Um, I wanted, yeah, I, I guess, uh, a little less octane, a little more biddable dog. Um, so that's kind of what I was looking for. And I saw actually that the sire, um, does run at, uh, or did run at Gladwin a lot. Uh, he's won a champ, couple championships up there. And, um, and actually Justin's trained the puppy, uh, had him for a few weeks for me. And it, I felt better when Justin said, well, if I was getting a dog, a setter, I'd get, I would have got one out of that litter too. So, oh, well, so I was like, well, <laughs> If that's not a placebo, that'll get you through the season, right? It, right. Like, I was like, well, if Justin McGrail says that, then I guess right. you, know, you might have. Well, the dog could be a total dud, but if you start with <coughs> that, that guy, uh, that guy's approval, then, you know, um, hopefully we, we went the right direction. And <coughs> so it's still from a field trial line. Was it bred out to a just a hunting line uh, or was uh, it? I think both of actually both the parents do field trial, but the guy, um, the kennel, I know he hunts quite a bit. Him and his family hunt a lot. So that so, ability for hunting for, I don't want to say an amateur, but they're trying to get a dog out there that could perform in the field trial. Right. Could also be the the opposite. It could just be the foot hunter without. Right. I know he, uh, when, he, when he trains, um, you know, he he's told me he uh, he tries to push his dogs he pushes his dogs out farther, like run them with another dog and try to get that competitive to push them out. Right. Um, so if you kind of, you know, it's, I'll say it's maybe easier to keep these dogs in or they don't, you know, traditionally run as big. We'll say, was my logic. And right. I like the guy's principles of what he was breeding for, you know, uh, mm -hmm. um, first uh, he looked for a bird finder and some heat tolerance and, you know, a pretty biddable dog was kind of his principles to breed on. So, um, so I, we'll try it out. See, see what we got. Pretty happy so far. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, um, I, I don't think he would be a field trial dog. He doesn't, uh, it's compared to the pointers. Um, you know, doesn't seem to run as big and I haven't let him, you know, I don't let him get out there, but he seems to, um, uh, stay with you a little more. So, yeah. Now, how, how did your pointers do, even though they you had that octane that you might have had a little buyer's remorse on? How did they do for, I mean, because it is it is such a classic pointer, right? I mean, it's like the classic pointer. I, yeah, I don't mean English pointer, but as in the yeah. pointing world, I remember when Justin and I were filming the Upland Institute, and, and for people who don't know what I'm talking about, most of the most everybody listens to this podcast knows when I have Justin on an episode, it's their favorite episode. Right. Uh, he's a consummate pointer setter guy. He loves it. Yep. And, and this guy was an old RGS member. I don't think he was from Roger Moore, but he'd been coming to Justin for 20 years with, you know, a new pup. And then a few years later, new pup. And he came out with two English pointers to Justin's uh, training facility. And just said, let's get this on camera. Just, we might get a little nugget, right? Where we're trying to get right. a beat roll and stuff. And this guy had an orange and white and a brown and white. Uh, they almost look like twins, you know, not a lot of, mostly white, little brown yep. ear and an orange ear and a little, little blaze. Cute as could be, long tailed. And Justin went out and put a couple chuckers out for him. And, and he even told the guy, he says, yeah, you know, like, I, I'm making this name up. I'm saying Bob, right? He's right. like, Bob, we, 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 we could just take him for a walk without birds. Let's just take him for a walk. And he's like, you know, he's a longtime customer. Justin goes, no, no, I want some birds out there. I want some right. birds out there. So right. Justin goes out and seeds the field with a couple birds. And, and these dogs were, he just got them home. They were like 10 weeks old or something or 12 weeks old, you know. Oh, boy. <laughs> I never saw instincts as good as that in my entire life of judging dogs from six to 16 years of age 
Right. These two pups. Now, granted, they didn't have a lot of big search. Obviously, they're puppies, right? Yeah. But when that nose connected with that chucker, and these dogs have never smelled a thing in their life. You talk, there was, I'd say a 12 o'clock and an 11 o'clock table, tail. And one, one was just as intense as the other. And on a second bird contact, the other pup backed the other pup. Okay. With, we know there was no possible way that other pup smelled what the first pup was smelling. Right. So it's like, you can't help but want to go toward those genetics, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would say there's some pointer breeders that are, yeah, they do a lot of, you know, line breeding and pretty yeah. hard, you know, hardcore breeding programs. You, you might so, have to be, you might have to be a semi pro trainer or at least learn how to harness it. But you, you've got some instincts there, you know, if you're not careful, you better hold on with both hands <laughs> until you get used to the Ferrari there. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good yeah. point. So you know, going back to camping out with you and Aaron, do you and Aaron, are you guys hunting buddies or are you just RGS buddies? Uh, we're actually, we're buddies now. We met, um, uh, through RGS. He said, I was you. He's like, I've reached out to a few chapters. And you're the only one that called me back. So <laughs> it, it was like, it was the greatest pickup ever for our chapter. Like, uh, you saw the commercial, not commercial rig, but like all the cooking stuff. And he's, oh. he's the mastermind of the, the cooking there so um yeah and now we're we're actually really good buddies now so now what what's he got for dogs i don't remember uh he has an english pointer now okay. and uh he's got a griffin and the griffin so he he started with the griffin mm-hmm. and then he was kind of like okay and uh i think he had actually went to a few field trials and he said I was amazed or blown away the first time I watched him release some dogs, like, you know, at the line, let them, let them rip. Yeah. Uh, And now, uh, I don't think, I I don't want to speak for him, but I don't think he would get another dog other than English pointer now. So. Yeah. He's yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like, I don't want to, what's the word for it. And, and I know there's a lot of Griffins out there and there's a lot of good ones, but it is not a dog that blows the cover and super impresses you early on, you know, right. they right. learn their trade, they learn their craft and they're good retrievers or good pointers. But when you go from a Griffin to a pointer, yeah, you're, you're I can see where he's like, <laughs> wow, I didn't know a dog could run that fast. <laughs> right. 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 Which again, the Griffin was not designed to run that fast, but right. It's, it's funny that he went from that to, in a short amount of time. Now, how old's his setter? His pointer? Hmm. I'm sorry, his pointer. I think he'll be three, or he just turned three. So he's had a he's had a couple seasons with him. Yeah, he he named it uh, Ricky Bobby. So it's oh, kind of fitting. Come on, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> so it's kind of fitting for a pointer. Oh my god. Well, that's but, yeah. Yeah. So are you, you got, I know I asked you early before we hit record, you, you pretty much, st- you kind of do something that I wish I would do more of. I always got this wanderlust and I want to go somewhere and hunt somewhere else. Right. You, but you pretty much stick around Michigan for the most part. Yeah. So, so far that's uh, basically on wild birds. I've been to um, like a couple quail down in um, uh, Georgia. I went quail hunting, um, Alabama. And quail yeah. hunting just on preserve preserve birds but wild birds pretty much stay in michigan um i don't know there's a lot of a lot of nice country in michigan and you can camp on state land you don't uh not a lot of travel required and yeah you don't have to um you know once you get to your campsite there's not a lot of travel and you can hunt quite a bit so i i have always questioned my sanity with my travels now I, I go to the Dakotas every year. Sometimes, well, this last few years, twice a year, South and North Dakota. Okay. I always have fun, and I always think about this. I just don't spank myself enough. When I first got to Michigan, that's all I hunted was Michigan, right? You know, and then the UP was like going to another state, but it's still <laughs> Michigan, right? Right, right. And the first chance I had to go to South Dakota, I went, and I started getting this wanderlust. And I cannot help but think about how many 
travel days I've been going out west, Montana, Kansas, Nebraska, you know, all over the place, right? If I added up all those travel days that I could have been hunting in my own backyard in Michigan, I might actually have a good grouse dog, you know? <laughs> well, uh, my one buddy's. I think you drive by a lot of birds going out to South Dakota, North yes, Dakota. Yes, exactly. All that. He's, like, you, he's like, you drive by a lot of birds. And I'm like, well, I, I agree. But it, it's on the bucket list to hit up Montana, you know, at least once just to say, just to see what, it's about. you know, nobody comes back disappointed from going on that trip. No. So, yeah, even if, I, you, even if you had bad weather and, you know, sparse birds, it, right. it's, it's a piece of country. That prairie country is you know, you, you, you do get to watch your dog work for sure. I mean, it's, um, and it may not be what you want to see, but in the woods, you kind of, you kind of like mask, like, Oh, I don't know where he's at, but he'll be fine. You know, maybe, but out, out West, you know, you get to see your dog the whole time for the most part. I Uh, mean, in the grouse woods, uh, my dog's never ripped a bird. I mean, I didn't, I've never seen my dog rip a bird. Never, (laughs) never. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Like, all the time, but you, you know, I mean, the, you, you don't very to, rarely get to see it. But yeah, you don't have to watch it, so you can't be that bad. Right, at him. Right. right, right. If you're hunting with your buddy, he won't be complaining at you. <laughs> and then when you do get one, you're like, "Yeah, I got it. No biggie, no biggie." Right, right. On um, the prairie, I, I would assume you can see everything unfold, good or bad. Right, and you're, uh, yeah, it could be, a, it could be a little, uh, it could be a little. Not unnerving, but it could be a little bit like you better be ready for some teasing from your friends if your dog doesn't do good. Where like right. in the grouse woods, you're like, I don't know them. You know them grouse, the hardest bird to hunt. You know, right? You know, they call him the king. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, what What do you think the the event the the summer grouse camp? Yep. What kind of what kind of attendance you think you can? I mean, can you handle? Is it you're looking for 20, 30, 50 people or more than uh, merrier? Probably, uh, I would say the more the merrier. We're pretty, I mean, I think we had about 50 people there last year. So um, we get 50, 60 people there, 70. Uh, I think we'd be in good. I mean, it's a wide open, well, you were there. It's wide open parking lot field. Yeah. Um, I mean, it can hold a lot of cars and people. So. Uh, we're just trying to get people to pre-register, just to make sure we got enough food. But yeah, if we get 50, 60 people, I think it'd be a success for sure. Well, I, I can't tell people enough. If if you're anywhere able to do this, and you know, it's it's a good time of year to do it. It's preseason. You're getting a little the little if you're the new guy that got the dog and you can't like like you and I were like, oh, I'm just gonna go hunting, don't know what I'm doing. Right. right. Go here and like you're not going to absorb everything you learn, you know, but you'll pick up one or two tidbits, whether right. it's on the trail, you know, when, when the biologist says, when you're walking on a trail and if you see this, they, you know, they call it a salad, right? You know, the, the grouse love the greens, right? Yeah. You'll, you'll pick up, you'll pick up some tips that will, if, especially if you're getting into this new, that will put you, I'm, I'm going to say it's going to throw you a couple years ahead of the curve. And that's only if you did research and hunt it. Right. And you'll, you'll pick up some, you'll pick up some tips on this. And you get, uh, there'd be, like I said, there'd be some professional trainers there that, I mean, a lot of people with their first dog, like, where do I go? Who do I turn to for, I mean, at least you can shake some hands and say you met somebody and, and then yeah. you can make the call of who you, you know, who you have a better connection with on dog training right. or, stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe just people in general that give you pointers. You know, Kevin, I've seen so many people over the years and, and I, I'm going to correlate this to all the judging I've done with, with NAVDA across the country. Yeah. We have, we have like 10 puppies on a, in a morning. That's our maximum for a puppy test. And you will always get, I'm just going to, I'm making numbers up. Five of them are going to be wallflowers. They're, they're there. They want to do something with their dog. And their breeder kind of talks them into it. And you're like, hi, uh, oh, hi. You know, they're a little, they're a little apprehensive. And you'll get a couple that ask questions. And you'll get one or two that ask if they can walk in the field. Right? Right. You're like, yeah. You're, you're, and that's what doing something like this grouse camp, it's like you get a little boost. 
And, you know, and, and even if you've hunted for a couple of years, if you've hunted for a couple of years and you think you got it nailed, okay, you don't have to come to Summer Girls Camp. But if you've hunted for a couple of years, you're like, how come I'm only getting 0. .67 birds a year? <laughs> right. This, this could really help. It really could right. help. Well, and then you're going to find out real quick that you're not alone. Yeah, and, that's that's the best you know, part. You got a right. community. You got a community right. behind you. Goes back to safety and numbers. Mm-hmm. When you're sitting around a campfire, going like, "I've already talked to everybody here, and I know that guy's the only guy that shot three birds." You know, right, right, right. But that's like the that's the whole fun of it. And then when you do connect with a bird, and everything works right, and the trees aren't in the way, you know, it, it's. I don't know. Like I said earlier, I, I have that wanderlust and I like to go out all over the country. But when right. I do connect with a grouse, and I'm not going to give the woodcock the credit it deserves because I think if you can get into enough woodcock, you should be able to harvest one. But you could go as a newcomer. You could go a couple of years without hitting a grouse if you're not lucky. You know, There's, that, bird has a way, that, ha, that bird has a way of saying, you can shoot at me all you want. I got... 67 trees between you and me while I fly away. We like to say there'd be a lot of a lot of long, lonely walks if it wasn't for Woodcock. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but and it, and it does make some of the fun up. We I I'm gonna finish with this. We had uh Pike Gear had a uh uh rough grouse hunt sweepstakes last year, and we had it up okay. in uh Gwynn, Michigan. And the guy that won it. Actually, it was a woman that won it, and she couldn't come up, but her son came up. Okay, he's, he's from Florida. He came oh, up. Wow. He came up from Florida with his girlfriend. She never grouse hunted in her life. He never bird hunted. Neither of them have ever shot anything on the wing. <laughs> but the first, the first question he asked me was, he's like, "How do I transport all the birds I get when I go hunting?" I said. Let's let's worry about let's worry about getting the birds. But he actually listened to our guide, and I think he got in two days of hunting. I think he got three or four grouse and three woodcock, and that's I didn't do that in my first year of grouse. Wow! Hunting. But you know we had good dogs, good habitat. It was, just, you know, we just had you know the odds were in our favor a little bit. We had a guide, you know, and 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 took him under his wing, but. Unless you're going to win that trip and, you know, go there with that guy that was, I think it was Kevin Stackowitz, I think is his name, something Stackowitz. Dennis? Dennis, Dennis, was, Dennis, Stackowitz. Dennis was the guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, unless you're going to do that, I would say try hitting this, the, the summer grouse camp for the Roger Moore chapter because, as, uh, as they said in Harry <laughs> Potter, the odds will be in your favor. Right. Right. And also, just as why we're recording – I mean, we are going to raffle off a gun too. You know, we're going to sell some tickets, and there will be a gun raffle too. So, nice. just what a, kind of gun? little. Uh, I'm not sure yet. We got it donated, so. Okay. Uh, but it'll, be, it'll be something you can shoot at a grouse with. But that is yes, I, I believe so. But it's whatever okay. the. We have a gun being donated, so. Okay. It won't uh, be. A, it won't be a goose gun, and it won't be a BB gun. Correct. So Other than that. It could be it could be a rifle. I will I won't say it won't be that, but it could be a grouse gun, could be a rifle, whatever. You know how these things work. You take whatever donations you can get and yeah, yeah. are very appreciative for all of them. So But this is not banquet like this is very open, no, no walk around no. uh like summer picnic y kind of thing. And yeah, the, like I said, the food the food's next to none. I mean, I, I don't I don't know that I've ever had a better meal than I had with you and Aaron up there. I mean, it was it, it and here's another thing. If you're just somebody who is a half-assed hunter and you want to learn more about cooking wild game or any game or any yeah. meal, come up and talk to Aaron. That that guy's yeah. that guy's a mobile chef. Yeah, we had man, yeah, because even Friday night we had food and then oh uh, all Saturday was phenomenal no it was a lot of fun and like i said i i'm 90 percent sure i can't be there okay 102 percent sure that i'll be there next year all but right great really encourage people to come up there you want to get into grouse hunting this is this is the start you know um and if you're just a newbie with grouse hunting 
come to this thing, learn something, learn about what they eat, learn about the dogs, learn about training. It, um, I know I, I think I jumped, as I typically do, I, I jump subjects. When I was talking about the Eagle River, Wisconsin one, that I can't remember the, the Rough Grouse Society chapter that put that one on, and that was like four years ago, this young okay. guy, um, he got into it. He came in with his new dog. I forget what I gave him. I had something in the truck that he needed. Another guy, he was talking about a wonder lead. Another, another grouse hunter said, here, I got an extra wonder lead. And this guy is, I don't want to say ankles deep, hip deep in concrete with, with hunting now. Because he, he came to a grouse camp and everybody welcomed you know, and, and that's what these things are like. You're, I just can't tell people enough, go to something like this. Don't be a wallflower. You, you don't have to jump up and be the most outspoken person like me or you, but walk over to somebody, shake their hand, meet them. And all of a sudden, boom, you're going to make the connections. You need to do this. And, you know, we, we do it, you know, RGS is for the habitat and for the bird. You and me are for the people, right? I mean, it's what we do. And then last year we had, uh, there was a five or six kind of, we'll call them good old boys that had been grouse hunting for 40 years. Yeah. They said, uh, this breaks summer. We just want to come see what it was about. And we've never been to Gladwin, the field trial grounds. And, you know, we've been hunting their woodcock banders and yeah. uh, grouse hunting for 40 years. And they, uh, they had positive feedback and said they'd come again. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you'll you'll meet a little bit of everybody up there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right, Kevin. I I told you we'd probably keep to about an hour, but anyway, um, unless you got any smack you want to talk about any of your buddies hunting or dogs or anything, we can uh, we can wrap it up and just tell everybody again to try to hit the summer grouse camp. It's it's August nineteenth. Uh, what do they got to do to sign up, Kevin? Uh, just uh, email or call me um, on the flyer, Roger Moore Chapter at gmail dot com. Just all you got to do is just send me an email to pre-register. So we got a head count. Yep. Um, or you can, you can call me, uh, whichever is easier for you. There's even a, a um, what is it? URL code on there. You oh yeah. You got up. a bar, barcode scan. Yeah. Yep. So you can do that as well. So if you're one of them high tech young people that love to use barcodes. Yep. Boom. You can do it. So yeah, check it out. It's the Roger Moore chapter of the rough grouse society, summer grouse camp. And it's, I, I can't tell you if, if you haven't been to one, go to it. And if you've been to it before, go again, because it's just, it's just fun. And that's, that's why I hunt. Yeah. I, camaraderie. It'll be, you, you won't go away hungry if nothing else. You won't so, go away so. hungry. You won't go away without a story and you won't go away without a, what was it? Ugly dog distillery drink at the end of right. the day. Right. Right. They'll be there mixing cocktails. So, you, you know, I'm a beer guy, but I could be talked into one. It, yeah. Everybody can be talked into one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot. All right. Hey, I appreciate it too, Ron. Thank you.